from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 106, recorded on March 24th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent. Dixon, oh, hello, Vin- and listeners. <laughs> hello, Daniel. We, we forget to How's say everybody? hello to everybody. How's everybody today? Chipper. It's a beautiful day today. It's sunny outside, right? Not bad. It's, it's, cool, it's really cool-ish. windy, actually, right? The wind cool-ish. is blowing. Yesterday really? was a much better day. 11 Celsius. Yeah, 11. Tomorrow it's going to rain. That's fine with me. The hydrological think, cycle is good. I think the snow is finished, right? Hard so, to say that. Well, one year it Hard snowed on Easter. So is this Sunday Easter? Is that right? So it's it snowed once on Sun on hey, Easter Sunday. I that do was a lot the latest. Of that's the latest I remember. I what? do a lot of trout fishing, right? I know you. And do. The latest it's ever snowed for me when I was trout fishing in the Catskills was in May. Oh, May. May, huh? Yeah. Catskills, and one year I was uh, in Alberta trout fishing in July. Well, that's Canada. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's still the summer. It was July. It well, was somewhere it's winter. And half time, of Calgary right? got covered with six inches of snow. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, here it's nice, and yep. it's getting True, slowly yeah. warmer. The daffodils are out. The crocuses are out. Crocuses have croaked already. And you know, I asked my class this yesterday. What's happening now that's relevant to virology and uh, parasitism? You know, the mosquitoes are starting to wake up. They are. Oh! It's been a long time. Do you know winter. a lot of them live in the subway tunnel? I do, I know. And in the and sewers. And in the sewers and under leaves in Central Park, right? Sure, that's how they And survive. you know, Dixon, if there are any viruses in them, they will come back the next year, this right? true. So now we will see if Zika will become autochthonous. What is US. your prediction on that, no, by the way? No, I don't think so. I don't either. Well, because of the species of mosquito that's necessary to carry it. Yeah, species. Viruses that spread in 80s species don't do well in the U.S. Even yellow fever got up to Philadelphia, right? Got here, got here. Didn't it get to Boston? Got here, too. And and then then in in the fall, it went away, and that was it. It did. And there was a rumor that that everyone went into church to pray that it would go away, and they stayed in there for a long time. They claimed it was several days or weeks, and the cycle broke during that time. Uh, And, of course, they uh, they attributed that, that to their prayers. They must have smelled good. (laughs) <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Three days in a church. Oh, no, well, they had nowhere else to go. They burned a lot of they incense. They knew nowhere else. They didn't know where else to go. You know, Dixon, this episode of TWIP is sponsored by the Auger Art Contest. Ah, oh, what is that, Vin? Of the American Society what for Microbiology. Well, what it is, Dixon, you take an auger plate. Yes. And, Which is a uh, derivative from a seaweed, correct? Yeah, auger, and it's got some nutrients in it so that yeah. bacteria and fungi they don't grow. Eat the auger, right? And you can pick your own plate. You could use a blood auger plate for all I care. Some auger, people do right. because it gives you a nice contrast. What bacteria, Daniel, do you typically isolate on a blood, blood auger plate? Uh-huh. Hemolytic bacteria? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, I think as Dixon was starting to make, it's not so much the auger, but as you mentioned, it's what you put in put there. In it's it, whether yeah. you just have regular yeah. blood or sometimes they actually cook the blood a little Here's bit. Here's one like agar. Streptococcus hey, yeah, you cook it. McConkie agar, you remember that one? I sure yeah. do. Anyway, you you basically stuff. grow something in an artistic fashion. Could be bacteria. It could be multiple bacteria. It could be fungi. You, mean you draw a picture with the bacteria. You could there. do that. People do that. And we did this last year. I was a judge. Oh, we got some great stuff. Really, some and of it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So this is the second year they're doing this. Now we don't want the plate. We want a photograph of the plate. <laughs> right. And you can find out how to send it in at bit.ly slash agarart2016. All one word. And you have until May 6th to get your masterpieces growing. And if you win, and if you are a runner-up, runner, runner up, you will be showcased in a gallery at ASM Microbe 2016, which is the big meeting in Boston. Is that a P2 or P3 gallery? This June? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> That's right. Boy, you're clever today, Dixon. Um, I'm feeling good, Vincent. I'm feeling good. Are you... Some days worse than others or better Everybody, than others? sure. We have ups and downs. There's no question about it. And what, an what determines that? No idea. Phases of the moon? Who knows? Mm. Who knows? I mean, getting a good night's sleep, does that help? Yeah, no, that helps a lot. Helps a lot. Having a full belly? 
Um, nah, it makes you lethargic. That's that's <laughs> puts me to sleep. Okay. <laughs> No, I always, uh, always like this agar art contest because I think there's a science aspect. Not only do they make yeah. amazing patterns, but a lot of these microbes have um, colors to them. They have pigments. All right. And so you end up not only with just an amazing sure. pattern, but all the different colors. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah and in fact, many people use the pigments very creatively. And these are many people who work in laboratories. Did anybody use uh, fluorescent green protein, I don't think modified we had any, bacteria? I don't think we had any fluorescent, but there are plenty of... Uh, yeah. They tend to be thinking. light. They tend to be, you know, a light microscopy or visual with, um, you know, not not with a laser stimulation. But black that would be interesting. I mean, they could they could yeah. be black light laser yeah. stimulation. Uh, we had taken some, a photograph. We had some great entries last year. They were a lot of fun to judge. Neat. And uh, if you win, you will get a free ASM book of your choosing. Mm-hmm. And of course, everyone will choose principles of virology. I think. <laughs> and then next, think? people parasites and plowshares. Of course, it's not an ASM Press book, Dixon. <laughs> it's too bad. Who published it? Columbia University. <laughs> they Press? did. Yes, they did. How's it doing? Uh, it's doing fine. It's in paperback version now, so it's fine. Are you wealthy? Oh, do you ever get wealthy producing books, Vincent? <laughs> Tell us about your virology. Book. <laughs> Some people do if it's a bestseller. Yeah, no, no, that's just you true. know. I was thinking about that last night. It's true. Let me, let me close up this ad, and I'll tell you my thought. So anyway, go to bit.ly slash agar 2016 and uh, find out how to enter and check it out. It's a lot of fun. I was thinking, authors get 15% at the most typically, right? At the most. Just think, you write the book, mm-hmm. no kidding. and you get less than a third no, of the money made. No, this seems a bit obscene, doesn't a pu- it? A publisher <laughs> has a lot of mouths to feed, as I found out. Yeah, because of course. for a while, we published parasitic diseases ourselves. Yeah. That's right. In and fact, I did. I did, well. did. You did very well. I did very well with it. And, you know, we published the book for uh, $14 a copy to print right? and $59.95 to sell. So the profit margin on that book was quite large. And, and actually, this is an interesting story for the listeners. It was originally published by Springer Verlag. And the third edition, they wanted to charge like $85 or $90 for the text. And I said, no medical student in the world would ever buy this book for that much money. Because it wasn't a very thick book. It still isn't. So uh, so I said, we're going to withdraw the book from you. And they said, if you do, uh, you will never be able to publish it under the name Parasitic Diseases. Because we own the title. <laughs> what they don't own is the content. Right. So I said, that's fine. We'll just call it Human Parasitic Diseases. Is that what you did? <laughs> no, they didn't. They said, no, I don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, okay, we'll give you the copyrights. We'll give you the rights oh, to the title. nice of them. And I, I took that, and then I, they asked me to go to lunch with them, to ask me some questions. This is about why I did this. It was a reason. Make more money, <laughs> two, right? Two editors are sitting there looking at me. Why did you do that? You know, because I must have been the only one that ever did that with them. And I said, I did it for the money. <laughs> you know, I had no grants at that point. I was using this money to to uh, fund some small amount of work through the, the office that I was now managing. Uh, websites, development, that sort of thing. So it it was a very interesting exercise. Well, very you know, it seems obscene that you get 15%. In it. I, so I only if you have a huge bestseller will you yeah, make right. substantial that's money. Right. And I think that's wrong, and that's why self-publishing is, Actually. Know, is getting traction. The problem sure. is that you don't have the publicity engine of a big publisher. No, this is right? true, and they put a lot of weight behind these things, and... A story that I read in The New Yorker about two years ago was about a woman who published the first book. It was a bestseller. She sold over 5 million copies. She got an advance royalty from the company. I think it was Random House for about, let's make it 20000 or $30,000, which she thought was a lot of money. Of course, they made millions on her book. Then she produced a second book. Vincent, take a guess how much money she got for an advance on the second book. Million dollars? Five million dollars. Whoa, that's a must. <laughs> what do you need that? Money. What do you need that much advance? So for? it's not because you're probably not going to get the money back from the royalties as, as it sells. The book companies. Uh, well, I don't her, know how that her works. Her agent, actually. her agent negotiated. Yeah, but that they clearly. they said we want another book from you, and they yeah. and she gave them another book, and she got a five million dollar advance. Are they knocking your doors down, Dixon? Like, oh, I don't think so. I don't know. They're knocking the doors down, but they're not. <laughs> they're coming in to drag me off. They want their money back. <laughs> no, they don't want their money back. <laughs> no, this is fine. Well, you don't you don't produce books to make money. You produce books to usually to make a point in well, academic some, literature. No, no, no. fiction make writers money. make want to make I a don't, living. No, no, no. I'm just saying for us though, the academic. Yeah, I understand. Like us, we we publish books because we want to influence the fields. 
You okay. Know, so, so I had a I had a niche bestseller book. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> just <laughs> thought I would try. Tell us. <laughs> really? <laughs> it, I was just looking up, you know, because my wonderful memory. It was called Go Live Smart Strategies from Davies Award Winning EHR Implementations. I would have that book. And in the, the tiny little niche of electronic health record implementations for a while, this was the bestseller. Wow. Yes. Yeah. You wrote this book? Do you want to tell I was us one how of, many you I wrote? was one of 10 contributors. <laughs> no. How many books did you actually sell, Daniel? <laughs> I have no I just I just watched the fact that wow, it's a number one bestseller number one for months right. and then it fell off the charts and you That's know. That's funny. So, hmm. but uh, Well, here in the Twix studio or the Microbe TV studio, I look at how high we are in the iTunes ratings. <laughs> how high of, are we? Well, actually, Twiv uh, moved up to number 2 briefly wow. last week. In the science and medicine category, um, which is the highest it's ever been, but you know it does. It, it's great, but of course, it doesn't it's not like being in the New York Times. Best the dollars don't come right. rolling in when that happens. No, <laughs> you know, if, if you walk into a uh, physical bookstore, yeah. always, like Barnes and Noble, they which have the New York Times bestseller list. I went to the Strand Bookstore. You yeah, did. It was fun. Oh, those books! Books are lovely. And I was at and the Green Room. Do you know what the Green Room is? I it's did. where you go before you go yeah, on stage. I've been to a lot of Green um, Rooms. The, it was actually the office of the owner. She nice. she wasn't there. She's apparently a daughter of a senator from oh, yeah. some western state, yeah. 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 and uh, she's she's the owner. And this was her office, and it was oh. very nice. And they even had food there, as if we were rock stars. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? Nice. But I got there too late to. Uh, have you could have any. called it if she was related to that blonde man who was killed off by the Indians at the Battle of Little Bighorn. You could have called it Custer's Last Strand. Yeah. That was a stretch, wasn't that a stretch? Yeah, I tried to, you know. Well, so are we ready to do the case from last uh, week? Daniel, <laughs> Daniel's oh, itching. Oh, 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 gee. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's do that. This is, I know, this I know is our the, listeners uh, love, us, love us, but. Uh, missionary you know, from who went to Lake Victoria. Yes, let, let me remind everybody and um, give the story for our people tuning in who may not have listened last week. This is the case of a 32-year-old um, gentleman who um, had several concerns. <laughs> the story was that um, he spent time doing religious missionary work in Kenya, performing baptisms in Lake Victoria with a number of his friends. He had uh, he had religiously, as we saw, taken his malaria no medications. He ate lots of interesting foods, and we went through a few of these, the chiclids, ugali, which is a corn-based food flavored with greens, a stew with some sort of meat, maybe beef, maybe goat. Um, and about five weeks after he returns, so about a month after he returned, he developed a rash with fever, um, difficulty breathing. Uh, when, he, when he talked to his friends, three of the four friends who were there reported similar symptoms. The one who did not get sick, we, we figured out, had not actually gone in the water and also had been a very um, picky eater. <laughs> um, there was no prior medical or surgical history. There was no history of drugs. Uh, apparently, there was some sexual activity. Uh, he was waist deep in the water, not wearing shoes. Uh, and he was noted um, on the initial presentation to have an elevated white blood cell count with 70% of these being eosinophils. He had a chest CT that showed nodules in the lungs. He saw a physician who said, you know what? It's just an allergy. You'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, right. sent, sent him away. Um, now, uh, he did notice that the water near his, um, where he went in was near a village, and there were rodents nearby. There was runoff. Apparently, there had been some heavy rains recently. Oh. And uh, this gentleman had um, Googled, had performed an internet search. I believe it was with Google, but it could have been with DuckDuckGo as <laughs> one of our, or DuckDuckGo as one of our listeners or emailers said. Um, so that was the story. And now he comes and sees a tropical medicine specialist to find out what could he possibly have and what should he do. All right. We had so quite good. a few um, guesses for this one. We did. First one is from Peter, who writes, Dear esteemed Twip Triumvirate, my brief diagnosis to the illness of the guys who were Desperate to baptize in Lake Victoria is schistosomiasis, most likely caused by schistosoma mansoni. Many hints given in the episode at aim at it, the rash with katayama, fever, and shortness of breath, weeks after returning home caused by nodules in the lungs, the elevated white blood cell count, notably the abnormal high amount of eosinophils, 
in particular staying for hours waist deep in the water of an African lake, noticed the healthy one who didn't go into the lake and not recognizing the village's poor sanitation habits appear very inept to me, and I will abandon any further, i.e. non-scientific comment, on the enterprise of baptizing native people in some kind of crash course. <laughs> Many greetings from Wiesbaden, Germany. Peter, still science teacher at a German secondary school. P.S. I found the note in Dixon's Parasitic Diseases extremely interesting that the schistosomiasis symptom of blood in the urine in ancient and modern Egypt, was seen as a male version of menstruation and considered as a rite of passage for boys. This is correct. How about that, Dixon? How about that is right. Dixon, the, the next one is from David. Have you found your place? I have. I did skip the first email because that was for last week's case. I did not. I mistakenly you know what? put it in there because we do make mistakes, and that's why there are erasers. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, the delete buttons on computers now. That's true. All right, David writes, Dear Day Twippers. That's very good. Thank you once again for an informative episode of This Week in Parasitism. After careful research, I would like to guess that the patient in Twip had contracted schistosomiasis from a schistosome species, most likely S. mansoni. It's, it, he doesn't say mansoni, though. It says S. Mans mansion. But I, I know he meant Mansonite. It's been corrected. Oh, that's it's all right. good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. This parasite has been found to be quite prevalent in Lake Victoria, and the rash, fever, and shortness of breath can all be symptoms of schistosomiasis. The rash is known as swimmer's itch, although it is odd that the rash developed weeks after the man returned. Typically, swimmer's itch occurs within hours of infection and doesn't last for more than a week, but there are always exceptions. The fever known as Katayama fever as a systemic immune response to the schistosomes <clears throat> as they circulate in the bloodstream to the liver through the lungs. The nodes, the nodules in the man's lungs could potentially be an immune response to the schistosomule within the lung tissue itself. The fact that a fourth friend did not go in the water and did not show any symptoms points to a waterborne illness. However, he did not eat much food either, which those who became ill did, however, I believe this is a red herring or an additional parasite could have been introduced into the consumption of local African dishes. However, I believe that the rash, fever, and difficulty in breathing are due to schistosomiasis. Keep up the well-researched and fascinating podcasts. Sincerely, David P. All right, Daniel. David writes, another David. Dear heralds of parasitic tidings, Uplifted by the success of my first diagnosis, I will try to find out the pathogenic origin of the case of TWIP 105's young man baptizing in Kenya. This time, there were lots and lots of possible sources of parasitic infection, and it almost seemed as if the missionary was intent on returning home with an infection of some sort. <laughs> as my previous email was quite long, I will try to be brief this time. To begin with, I used Dr. Griffin's China pneumonic as a first selection for eosinophilia. Given the infection, infectious nature of the pathogen, three out of four friends showed comparable symptoms, connective tissue disease, idiopathic eosinophilia, and neoplasia could be excluded. Allergies, the original diagnosis of the U.S. doctor, might be a reason, but seems very unlikely given their recent travels. A simple search on parasites, Lake Victoria, Kenya, returned a number of hits suggesting that the idyllic shores of Lake Victoria are second to none when it comes to parasitic <laughs> infections. As the majority of the hapless missionaries were infected, I guessed it would be a very common infection. Common protozoans easily found on the local markets include Entamoeba histolytica, Giardia lamellia, and Balatinium coli, but these do not cause eosinophilia. Mm -hmm. This narrowed down the list to Ascaris lumbacoides, hookworms, and Trichris trichora, commonly infesting local food. The other major parasites very prominently present in Lake Victoria are Schistosoma mansoni and Schistosoma hematobium, causing Bilharzia. Trichuris does not seem to fit the symptoms well at all. Both Ascaris and hookworms and Cyclostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus can cause Loeffler syndrome with eosinophilic pneumonia. Still, given the combination of rash, the fever, and the lung nodules, I bet on Schistosoma. Drug of choice would be Praziquantel. I wonder why our guy even bothered taking Malarone. <laughs> he threw all caution overboard when it concerned other parasites. It is, it is ironic that their aquatic activity was baptism. 
if in one way or another the local population had escaped infection so far, I hope God's blessing protected them while they were being baptized. <laughs> Greetings from a hot and humid Hino, Hinotepe. Looks good. Hinotepe. Hinotepe. 28C at 8 p.m. Kind regards, David. Hello, TWIP team. First, I'd like to follow up on episode 105 and mention the possibility that infected brine shrimp might exhibit gregarious activity. Mm. I'm uncertain if that's known to be the case, but it certainly wouldn't be the first time a parasite altered a creature's behavior. Certainly not, Dixon, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Now for the case study. Young male with travel history presenting with transient rash, which I would like to know more about, but I'm going to venture a guess that it wasn't purulent and was localized probably to regions that had contact with water. Fever and shortness of breath. Exam shows lung nodules and eosinophilia. The nodules, shortness of breath, fever, nodules again, (laughs) and travel history make me at once suspicious for tuberculosis, but the incubation period seems rather short. The patient lacks the characteristic cough, and I would hardly expect eosinophils to predominate. Additionally, the two other baptizers falling ill with similar complaints suggests a shared infectious organism. With a shared exposure history, such a high R0 in such a short period seems uncharacteristic of tuberculosis. Going with the eosinophilia, shortness of breath, and travel history, I would suspect hookworm, but he lacks some things we might expect, such as diarrhea, rash to the soles of his feet, and abdominal pain. Those seem like weak, pertinent negatives, though, and it would be prudent to seek a stool sample. My expectation weighed most heavily by his and his friends all day exposure to fresh water in an endemic area with recent runoff from populated areas, is schistosomiasis. The signs and symptoms fit reasonably well also. A stool sample should nail the diagnosis and indicate treatment with praziquantel. Thanks so much for the countless hours of edutainment, Kurt. It is your turn, Dixon. I don't know if I can read this one. It's uh, very... uh, Emily writes, schistosomiasis, question mark. Right. (laughs) Okay, you take it, Dave. <laughs> no, no, now you go to Christina Wrights. <laughs> Christina writes, Dear Twipalentiasis. I think yeah. it's Twipalentiasis. Yeah, it's Twipalentiasis. like ep- el- elephantiasis. Yeah, well, tri- Twipalentiasis. That's mm-hmm. a new one. My name is Christina and a graduate student in the Infectious Disease Program. I work with an avian virus, but our graduate coordinator always invites us to branch out of our research focus and learn about other infectious agents. I've found the case studies on TWIP to be very entertaining and have reviewed and has revived my interests in parasites. And so here's my guess. I believe the patient has schistosomiasis. Hmm. Schistosomiasis is found throughout the world and is common where there is poor sanitation. Consistent with the patient's exposure to fresh water, this parasite is contracted in fresh water contaminated with schistosoma saccharae. The saccharae are released by infected snails, <clears throat> that's a segue to the uh, paper we're about to produce and discuss, and swim around until they find a host and penetrate through the skin, after which the parasites enter the circulation and pass through the heart, lungs, and then to the liver. <clears throat> like our patient, the parasite can cause widespread nodules in the lung. Acute schistosomiasis can present as rash, fever, cough, and shortness of breath, which occurs between four to six weeks after exposure. Eosinophilia is also consistent with a schisto infection, and so it appears that our patient is experiencing acute schisto. A Google Scholar search for schistosomes in Kenya led me to a paper that said that prevalence of schistosoma mansoni in school children is 60.5% in an area around Lake Victoria, and so our patient's chances of exposure is probably high. Thank you for all that you do, and keep twipping. Keep twipping. And from UGA, that's University of Georgia, I guess, Dixon, right? You bet. You yep. think so, Dixon? I would guess UGA or UGA, as we <laughs> refer to it. Is that uh, the affectionate? <laughs> affectionately referred to it. Actually. All right, let me jump in. James writes, lung fluke paragonomous species. At first thought, leptospirosis, but pulmonary hemorrhage wouldn't look hmm. like nodules on CT. Wow, totally different, huh? Totally different. Why don't yeah. you think Elise is Elise also? writes, dear twip trifecta. How are you? Spring is creeping up on lower Manhattan. Today it is murky, but 61 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 C. I am very curious about this case. and not sure if I have got a correct diagnosis, but here's an attempt. 
In light of the patient's long immersion while performing baptisms in the waters of Lake Victoria in Kenya, I believe he may have schistosomiasis. It makes sense that his initial doctor didn't recognize his symptoms because there are not many cases in the United States, though one source suggests that 85% of the cases in Africa, so given the patient's travels and behavior, it may have been worth looking into diseases endemic where he had been traveling. The patient's symptoms are consistent with schistosomiasis. He has a rash, some fever, and nodules in his lungs, which brings about his shortness of breath, and his extremely elevated eosinophils are all strong indications that he is hosting this helminthic infection. The timeline is also consistent with schistosomiasis. The patient and the friends of his who went into the water with him didn't start to present symptoms until several weeks after their exposure to the water in Lake Victoria. And the fact that they returned before exhibiting symptoms may have led to their later diagnosis. Does the later diagnosis mean that the travelers might sustain greater damage or will they all recover just as easily as they would have had they been diagnosed earlier? There are long lists of potential complications from schistosomiasis, including squamous cell bladder cancer, neuron neuron schistosomiasis, infertility, and renal failure. Are these men at all likely to find themselves with long-term sicknesses? As far as a differential diagnosis goes, and perhaps what the doctors, what the patient's first doctor suggested, these symptoms are so general that they could indicate an autoimmune disease or an inflammatory disease, and perhaps the first doctor didn't connect the symptoms to the patient's travel since he had returned to the U.S. quite a number of weeks before his symptoms developed. I am sorry to be writing in haste. I'm struggling with the schedule and upheaval, but I am very <laughs> eager to hear the answer to this mystery. As always, thank you so much for everything you do. Best wishes. A schedule in upheaval. Very, very poetic, don't you think? <laughs> Clever choice of words, I would say. Our last one is from Alan. I wanted to say something. Now, what was it? It's left me. It has left me. Oh, well. Alan writes, Dear Twip, sounds like schistosomiasis to me. Lake Victoria, not the best for swimming or wading near the shore. Used to need to pay someone to ingloriously carry us out to the canoes. Uh-huh. The rash does seem a little delayed to me. Temp is still 27C as usual here. Sorry, no time today for a fuller DD. Loved your story about f fluorinathine and the search to find a commercially valuable way to keep it available for trypanosomiasis. Those jewels make it worth coming back. Best regards, Alan in Kona. Now, wait a minute. Are you saying Alan? Otherwise, you don't want to come back? <laughs> It's getting boring. <laughs> it's the jewels. It's the jewels. It's the jewels. This He's is here a, for the jewels. Kona, I presume, is in uh, Hawaii. Hawaii. The you big bet. island. It's where you the Kona, western, where it's sunny. Where the very expensive coffee comes from. Okay, Dixon, if you say so. Yeah, well, it's true. It actually is true. <laughs> All right, so we had quite a varied crop here, didn't we? We certainly did. We had a lot of schistosomiasis, but we also had... The last one. It was, was a paragonimus. We had paragonimus, paragonimus we leptospirosis. Had, we had tuberculosis uh, as an initial guess, but the, they were right in differentiating it and uh, rejecting it as a choice. So most of them are just the semias. Most of the guesses are just okay. the semias. Right. I, I don't know. You know, this whole thing, <laughs> like the guy, like Peter said, you know, doing baptisms in a place where we know you're going to get some kind of parasite. This doesn't seem right, <laughs> doesn't it, Dixon? It does seem a little bit against the principles of um, prudence and behavior that, uh, you know, in keeping with the fact that you know that something yeah. might be wrong. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Daniel, you uh, this was your case. Is that correct? Well, let's let before I before I give the answer <laughs> here, let's let Dixon. Um, well, let both of you. You start first. Um, what, what are you thinking? Are you gonna Are you gonna go with the crowd, the Democratic? Well, I actually was thinking just the last time when we did this before the crowd, but that's okay. <laughs> we were. <laughs> we were Dixon and I actually had a little consult, and we decided it was uh, schistosomiasis. Yeah, based on the symptoms and as well the this is the, true the water. Yeah, right? yeah. And we didn't. You know, the runoff is consistent, right? Hard. To, to pass up just though, as your first diagnosis, actually. Did you did you treat this young man? So so well, let's let's give you the diag. We're going to go through this a little more slowly because so I once testified. Treat, you saw this young man. You saw this. <laughs> so this man. this gentleman was seen by a colleague of mine actually colleague, here okay. in New York. Got it. Um, so they actually were from upstate New York is where they lived, and they came down to New York 
um, to be treated mm-hmm. here at uh, all right and uh, so the so okay we will say yes it is it is schistosomiasis but we should talk about how the diagnosis was made mm-hmm. was, I'm very curious about that part yeah so the um, so the diagnosis was not made as we mentioned during the initial presentation Correct. when you had the rash the trouble breathing um, and and a, a lot of our um, people who emailed in talked about the rash and so I want to point this out um, the, the timing and how this works. So we think in this case that these individuals were exposed during the baptisms. Mm-hmm. And uh, we think that it actually, it's not as though uh, the infective stage hits your leg and immediately penetrates. We think there's actually a period of time. And uh, I, I took Dixon's advice in this when I was swimming in fresh water in Africa, is that when I got out of the water, I would towel myself off very quickly mm-hmm. with the hope that then I would prevent them from, from penetrating. Right. Um, and uh, so far, because, so good. Because <laughs> what we we actually think that it takes about thirty minutes of contact for the uh, yeah, for the invasion right. of the skin. So when so, you come out of the water, they're on you. They're on you, and as they start to dry, as these little drops start to dry, it seems to be triggering yeah. um, the penetration. They actually um, form little uh, menisci around each individual hair, mm-hmm. and the cicaria are swimming in this little bubble of water. And as the water dries out around the hair, I've actually watched movies of this in animal models, and the cicaria actually can penetrate down along the shaft of the hair mm-hmm. until it gets down to the bottom, and that's actually how they get in. So if he had worn some sort of tight-fitting pants, it would have prevented it, right? I mean, sure. I mean, a lot of swimmers itch, which is an equivalent. Uh, it's a bird just to that's prevalent in fresh and, and salt water. Mm-hmm. Um, so clam diggers itch is one of the uh, symptoms for this thing. Uh, you guys who go out and, or women too, uh, with big uh, clam, um, I guess they're called uh, hose. Mm-hmm. And, and But yeah. they're standing in waist deep water the whole time they're doing it next to their boats. They go back and if, the first year nothing happens because you become sensitized, but nothing really happens. The second year and the third year you go back, you can't stand in the water because the moment they start to penetrate these Hyper allergic reactions occur at the wow. penetration site. So, <laughs> these guys had a rash. Did, did you mean well, to tell what, me that so was no, their first what, visit yeah. to uh, Lake Victoria? No, or maybe that's what been I there wanted. To, that was what I thought was really interesting in the emails. Is that when people learn about just a they they learn about the swimmer's itch and they think, oh, the rash, um, the exposure. So let's say they had been standing in the lake and the rash was described as on their legs, etc. Mm-hmm. That would be much more consistent with this avian um, just right? Um, now but the, the other thing is, if you yeah. don't mind me interrupting, the uh, but even if you do, <laughs> even if you do, I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> but I would like to, I'd like to add the fact that if you're standing in water at a certain level for a long time, that's where the rash is going to be. It's not going to be all over your body. It's going to be right where the surface met your skin. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because that's the that's where they're swimming. They're actually negatively geotropic and positively phototropic. We'll get to, t- to talking about this little swimming stage. So they're in the surface film. And they're following trails of lecithin, which is coming off of your skin. So they're, they're migrating towards the highest concentration, and that's you. And then once they find you, they'll, they'll start penetrating the hair follicles right around wherever you're in the water deepest, right. too. If you're standing to your knees, it's your knees. If it's your waist, it's your okay. waist. Yeah, so I, so I should point out for our listeners that the rash in this case that was described was a full body rash. Oh, right. And so this is a different rash. This is not an allergic reaction to the um, circarial penetration. This is an inflammatory response um, to basically the stage in the lungs. And so um, the, they don't develop it right away, uh, like sort of a, a second exposure. This is, a, and I think a lot of people were thrown off by that because when you when you learn about schistosomiasis, you learn about the rash of swimmer's itch. But part of the acute Katayama fever presentation, which is what he saw the initial doctor with. Um, that's this whole inflammatory response. And some people get confused in endemic areas between typhoid and schistosomiasis, cardiomyopathy, sure, fever, because sure. there's this full body yeah, um, right. um, rash that develops. So, so where is cardiomyopathy, by the way, just as an aside? Anybody know? Well, so I, I, do because, do know. I do because, well, we should, we're going to actually have to talk about this because okay. um, in your book, I, when I went through the references, <laughs> I, came, I came up with a different, um, you had said, let me go here. I mean, we have a discrepancy. We had a discrepancy oh, when I was no. going through your book. Um, Not again. <laughs> it was another. No, but it's going to be corrected in the in the next one. Um, but well, we, why don't you go first? 
No, no, because <laughs> all I know is the one in my book. <laughs> no, I think in the book you refer to as a kata, katayama. Um, actually, I can, I can. It's in Japan. Search, it is in Japan, and it was just you know, it's this subtle thing that we all um, talk about. It's whether it was a gorge or a river. So. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to be called on the carpet for something like that. Yes, yes. But Katayama <laughs> was a so place. So it's, it's a place. It is a place where you in catch Japan. this infection. It was highly endemic. But which which one of which infection did they catch in Japan? Well, so it was Japonicum ah, actually when it was first described. An even different one yet. Yes. Right. So you've got three. Why was the rash delayed? So the rash in this case is occurring at that four to five weeks when you basically have the pulmonary. Um, and so it's not the penetration. The general. It's and the same nodules that you're seeing in the lung. Again, this is part of this um, this response. Okay. So what clinched the diagnosis? So in this case, in a sense, the man was lucky. By the time he came to see the tropical doctor here in New York, he had progressed past the Kaniyama, Kaniyama fever stage, and now he was actually releasing eggs into the stool. Mm -hmm. um, and Went this, a long way down the road. Yeah, so this is this is weeks. We're talking about eight weeks from the penetration right. to being seen by the um, by the clinician. And well, they he, could make it by doing a stool. It so and that's actually what happened in this case. Well, he had several tests done. Um, he had serologies done. Yeah. Um, which is um, they make is a very easy test. You're looking for the immune response. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that would be confusing. Um, if, let's say, the person had come in with Kadayama fever, they just start having the symptoms, maybe the serologies will be starting to become positive, but they won't have eggs in the stool yet right. because mm -hmm. they haven't gotten to the part where you have adults producing eggs. Um, so that could have, you know, even if you had the physician who was thinking of it, you're going to have to make the diagnosis a lot of times clinically, or maybe you're going to mm -hmm. be starting to get positive serologies but you'll have negative ovum parasites, negative stool exams until you get to the later stage. Yep. And by the time this person um, was seen at the, the tropical medicine clinic down here in New York, <laughs> um, he had these wonderful eggs with this spike, this lateral spine coming out. So very recognizable. Right. right. Um, nice. And what was he treated with? Well, so the treatment actually depends again on the timing hmm. and, uh, if here he is eight weeks, you know, you say, oh, now you, you know, you have this and you treat him. Right. Um, and there's, there's several reasons to treat him. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, someone could say, well, it's a, it's a low level infection. You don't have any symptoms at this point. Why expose you to this medication? The problem is these eggs can actually dislodge, dislodge. And sometimes they can actually go to the spinal cord. And there was an unfortunate story, um, number of years back where there was a gentleman also in New York state who had been to Africa, somewhat similar story. Um, and one of the eggs actually went to the spine and in the spinal cord, there was an inflammatory reaction. The man was permanently paralyzed. Um, so it's, it's a low risk. I'll admit, right. There isn't a lot of people in endemic areas who are, are paralyzed from this infection, but you always want to treat it because there's this risk. So you mm -hmm. want to round up the other friends as well. Make sure you treat them also make sure you eradicate mm -hmm. this. Mm. So, so he was treated with Prozicoab. Is there a name for this egg induced inflammation in the cord? Um, no, I don't think they give it a special. Okay. Um, so I've I've got two more but ways a, of diagnosing It's a kind of myelitis, this. I presume, right? That's exactly yeah, what it yeah, is. The right. egg, and you get an inflammatory reaction, and it's Sorry. destructive. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Dixon de Palmier. No, no. It's <laughs> my, my apologies. <laughs> Not at all. Go ahead. I just wanted to add some, uh, some um, colorful stories to this otherwise very colorful story. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've been at this medical center for a long time and, and, and I used to be called in to consult with regards to, uh, I guess, fascinomas. They used to call them fascinomas. Up fascinomas. That, that was their favorite word in pathology for something they had never seen before. So, you know, the one that I remember most of in, in this fascinoma type of arena was a, a cab driver from New York City or a cab driver in New York City, but not from New York City whose name was unfortunately the same as a very famous jazz musician, in this case, Ahmad Jamal, uh, mm -hmm. the piano player. So, and I love his music. That is Ahmad Jamal's music. I don't know if the cab driver plays at all, but uh, the cab driver was brought in uh, to the emergency room because he had been shot right, in the abdomen. And so they performed the operation necessary to repair the damaged gut tract, which the bullet had passed through. And they resectioned it and took the section of gut that was damaged and threw it up to the pathology group, which then 
embedded it in paraffin and then did some sections and found a fascinoma. <laughs> so mm-hmm. they invited me up. And when they told me the name of the patient, I think in those days we were allowed to do that, but they can't do this anymore because that's a HIPAA re- violation. Um, they said, Ahmad Jamal has been shot. Would you like to take a look at what we see? Because we don't know what we're looking at. <laughs> and it was a male and female schistosome wrapped up in the mesenteric venules of the small wow. intestine. Oh, wow. So he, he had a, a schistosome infection. And guess where he was from? He was from Yemen. Because they've got it there, mm-hmm. too. Okay, so that was case number one. Case number two was very similar to the one that we were discussing here. Four people went on a safari in Africa. They went to Ethiopia. They f- rafted down the Omo River. The Omo River in Ethiopia is a wild and crazy river. It's white water all the way. It's got lots of uh, class four, class five rapids, and it's a very popular spot with extreme sports fans. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but... It's got lots of schistosomiasis in it because mm. the monkeys in that area carry the same infection because they can be reservoir hosts in some cases. And in this case, they were. They all came back from their trip. Three of them um, <laughs> went to... You mean twip. <laughs> they went from their twip to the trip. That's right. They eventually all got sick except one. The three of them got diagnosed as having schistosomiasis. Mm-hmm. They then called the fourth person who was living in Florida at the time. And they said, you should go get yourself checked out by a doc. We've just been diagnosed with schistosomiasis and we've gotten treated. So he said, okay, I'll do that. So he says, but you know, I really don't think I have anything wrong with me. So he spent some time in Florida trying to procrastinate, I guess, and not <laughs> tell not to go to a doctor. But unfortunately, here's what happened. He was driving along with his daughter in the back. The um, eggs had reached his brain. He had um, a paralytic event. He swerved and crashed into a lamppost. And his daughter sustained a concussion. concussion, But he actually frank exposure of brain tissue. Oh, my gosh. And they rushed him off to the hospital. And they patched him up and took this piece of brain tissue. And when they sectioned it, guess what they found? They found eggs of schistosome Mm. manzani. So that was the proof that he was infected. And as I recall, now there was some nuance here that I didn't tell you about. That is to say, he went to a doctor. And the doctor did all of the proper tests. Mm. But they didn't take enough stool. And they didn't find the eggs. And he says, no, you don't have it. So then he went back down to Florida, and that's when he got this episode, and that's when he was diagnosed. And I was involved in the court case because I was called it as an expert witness as to how trans how it's transmitted and this sort of thing. It was it was a quite interesting case. the The doctor who said you don't have schistosomiasis was acquitted mm-hmm. of any wrongdoing, not even having taken the wrong amount of sample or stuff like this. He was the only doctor in the area that was. Um, willing to live in that rural zone. And the feeling was among the jurors after I talked to them after this trial was that they knew he was guilty of not doing the right test, but they didn't want him to leave. So they acquitted him so that he wouldn't be forced out of his practice because they really liked his, his positioning, although he wasn't an expert and not just a semiasis at all. And it was, it was a very interesting interplay. So he didn't take enough stool. He didn't take enough stool, right? They did these little tests uh, where they have a, a fluid of um, formalin, and then you take the stool and, and you allow it to fill up to a certain level. You shake it all up and send it off to the lab, right? You need to put enough in, huh? Yeah, well, you need a day's worth to catch it this one. day's worth. I'm also, day's I'm also worth. wondering, was it hematobium that um, was the sort of the villain in that case? And the reason I, well, you, it, well, you it, nod. It, it turned it was, out to be just a It was Mansonite. It could have been hematobium, yeah. and if that's the case, of course, it's not in the uh, stool yeah. at all. It's, okay. in the, it's in the urine. Cool. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, those, those are some sort of the, I guess, the subtleties that These are make sure I, I mention. These without yeah. a serological test or a DNA test. Yeah. These are tough to make. Fortunately, we now have all those, right? And so we that's talked right. about, that's so we right. talked about, let's say it had been the six weeks in, Five, we'll make it five, we'll make it tough. It probably takes about six weeks before the serological tests become positive. So right. an initial presentation of cardiac fever, your serology might be negative, your stool yeah, yeah. definitely be negative. There are actual glycoprotein cl- cl- antigens. So you can test for the antigens. They'll be circulating. That's right. Um, but yeah, sort of subtleties of knowing that 
there are some nucleic at amplification, nucleic acid amplification tests right. available. Right. Um, but the other things, it depends on the species. Let's say it's hematobia. That's your urine one. Um, to diagnose that, you want to do concentrated urines. Um, sometimes you'll actually see these rectal snips where they can look for it. Um, but yeah, it's if you just Not do a normal, <laughs> you do a normal stool O and P for some of these guys, yeah, yeah. just once and a small volume, you may miss them. That's um, and part of that is there's actually a, a cyclic nature to the shedding. You may miss when the shedding, the shedding may not have occurred in that feces. And then what's a rectal snip? Uh, <laughs> it's actually a little biopsy. If the no, rectal, me, no, okay, me, he's going <laughs> to, no, I'm going to tell you why it's called a snip and not a biopsy because it, it is a biopsy. Of course it's a biopsy, but they don't preserve it because this is, yeah. this has to go back to an old test that they used to do for this. If you, if you call it a biopsy, They'll send it off to the pathology lab, preserve it in formalin, section it, and they'll show you the egg, and you'll say, hmm. But you won't know if the egg is alive. So you don't know if it's an active infection. I see. Instead, if you call it a rectal snip, mm -hmm. it was diverted from the pathology lab to the parasitic disease <laughs> lab. So then what you could do is you yeah. could take a little piece of the tissue, which was still alive, and press it between two glass slides. Right. And express the tissue so that you could see the eggs. And then with a high power magnification lens, you could focus in on the flame cells. Now, flame cells, what the heck are flame cells? Flame cells are part of the excretory system for the stage of the parasite that lives inside the egg. It needs to respire. And so you can see these things, and they, they look just like flames. They look like two candelabras. <laughs> and you can see them, and they're, you can see the cilia going like this. Yeah. I'm doing this with my hands. Imagine me doing rhythmic. <laughs> right. Keep, uh, it up. Keep it up. <laughs> so, so if you see the flame cells, you know it's a live infection, and therefore you're obliged to treat. And treatment, of course, is tough in those days. They had something called fuadin, mm -hmm. named after King Fuad in, Syria, in, in Saudi Arabia. This drug was so toxic, and you had to give it so many times, that patients never came back for the fifth or sixth treatment because you had to inject it intramuscularly. It caused necrosis of the muscle tissue. It was an awful drug. Praziquantel totally revolutionized the treatment of schistosomiasis. Hmm. Absolutely, totally revolutionized it. Which, by the way, it inhibits the calcium ion channels of the tegument of the parasite, and that's how it works. But um, food, no one knew how it worked. The font of knowledge. Is yeah. well, he, has, he has a font of knowledge. Historical, <laughs> hysterical knowledge. Is hysterical hysterical, hysterical yeah. knowledge. Yeah, yeah but um, you know, as a technician, your eyes pop out of your head when you see something like this, though, right? For the first time, I'm just out of college, and they say, oh, we've got another rectal snip. Here, come on over and help us look. Now, if you err and you take too deep for the rectal snip. You get all the blood, and then, yeah. You get mess. more than blood. Yeah. You might lose your patient. Yeah. Why is that, Dixon? Because they might bleed out. Really? Absolutely. From a little snip? Well, you just little, put a little pressure, little. right? You just need you need to convince someone to keep pressure there for a long time. <laughs> but they can go home, <laughs> and then, you know, they have but to... But what are you talking... Are you talking about going into the rectum? I yes. usually... People usually... I have not heard of people die from this, I will say. <laughs> they were, I, I understand the fear. But. <laughs> well, perhaps. Perhaps that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But, yeah, it's an instrument with a, with a hole in it. All right, it looks like a little uh, probe with a hole at the end, and as you press it on the um, rectal tissue, some of it pops up through it, and then you can snip it off, and you can bring that back to the lab. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you do snip off some tissue. There's no question about it. Okay, that's fine. We can spare. Yeah, and I will. I will say some of what sounds like sort of details of knowing like how the medicine works and the mecha. Actually, in treating this is somewhat important because in Kadayama fever, you don't have adults yet. Right. And so if you think like, oh, I'm right. just going to treat with praziquantel, praziquantel is uh, only effective uh, uh, against the old states. It's right. sort of useless um, right. at that point. Um, seemingly, it may make symptoms worse. So actually during the acute mm -hmm. stage, people often use anti-inflammatories. They'll use ah. steroids. And then they'll wait several weeks until oh. the, um, the adults are in place. And then they'll go ahead and actually use a praziquantel. So I must... So, and then I have to ask the current question. <laughs> now, yes. this is a question. <laughs> yeah. So what if you went to Katayama today? Do you think you could expect to find schistosomiasis still there? I would have no basis for knowing, Dixon. Right. So what if I told you that it's not there anymore? What would you assume happened? They stopped using human feces for fertilizer. That's number one, but that's not always good because schistosoma japonicum can also infect animals, particularly oxen. So it's a huge problem in China. It's a huge problem. 
was a huge problem in Japan. Japan no longer has schistosomiasis. China still has it. What's the difference? They stopped using oxen in Japan? Yes. Really? What did they use instead? Horses. Horses. They don't do And they determined that horses are not susceptible. Mm-hmm. But oxen are. So with the oxen, Dixon, the feces runs off into the water? Is that yeah, the oxen yeah. are plowing through rice paddies, right? Yeah. Even if you told every person from China to stop defecating, uh, <laughs> would, quite would a, you permit quite a me? picture. <laughs> would you, right. I mean, no, no, stop defecating in the rice, rice fields. Yeah, yeah, got you it. see the bathroom over there? Please use it. Yeah. You want to tell your oxen to do that? Of course you can't do that, right? So controlling... Schistosomiasis in, in China is huge. And in Japan, it was a snap of a finger. They just said, we don't want this anymore. I have a poster. Poster. I was just going to say you have a poster out there. I do. I'd like you to put it's, that up on our show. It's been put up. It's been put okay, up. Okay, fine. Why didn't we remember? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I took a anyway. picture ages ago on the schistosome. Yeah, episode. that's true. That's true. Well, I think they can go back and see that episode, then they can see it. There's so many things you remember, Dixon, but then it's from all my so teaching. many things you don't remember. <laughs> oh, the, <laughs> you see this little finger? That's how much memory I have left. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying you're full? No, no, I'm saying that I've lost a tremendous a lot. So this gentleman recovered uneventfully? He did great. His friends got treated. They did great. The did other person tell him, was uninfected. Did you tell him the risk associated with standing in the water? You know, <laughs> you know, you know. it's interesting. It's it's always, you know, in hindsight, we look back, why would he have done something like that? But as I was sort of alluding to the fact that I was in um, East Africa um, mm-hmm. for Christmas the year before last with my family. And we're on our way to Lake Malawi, the calendar lake. And of course, I'm telling everyone in the car, it's like, nobody's swimming in that lake. There's, you know, just the semiasis. Yep. We'd be <laughs> fools. And we get there. And you know what? It's just so hot. And the lake is just <laughs> oh, so pretty. You can't, you can't resist. <laughs> so we went swimming. We weren't even like saving anyone's souls. We were just cooling <laughs> down from the heat. You're saving the souls of your feet. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, people, you know, you go on vacation. You're, you're enjoying yourself. Sure. And, uh, you know, people have, people take risks so you're and, a uh, you're a you're a yacht man, aren't you? Sure. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so the the Lake Victoria Yacht Club uh, used to pride itself on the fact that it had blood in its in their urine. They actually were proud of that fact because what they had to do was they had to wade out to their dinghies in order to get to their mm. boats, which are anchored farther out. By the way, if you were to swim in the middle of Lake Victoria or somewhere maybe 150 to 200 yards away from the shore, you probably wouldn't catch just the semiasis at all mm. because the snails that carry it live right along the shoreline. Yeah. They don't live in the yeah. deep water. That's yeah, so what the guy said. He was carried from the bank to the canoe. Exactly. But the other danger of swimming in Lake Victoria is... You know what the big issue was? There were lifeguards there, and I'm, I'm looking at the lifeguards and wondering, do these guys know how to swim? And what they actually were doing is they were watching for the crocodiles. Exactly. <laughs> and when the That's crocodiles would get too close, my, we had to all get out Forget of the water. Forget about it. <laughs> or hippos, or hippos. I mean, yeah. Do you remember we had a discussion of cichlids last week? I did, you? I did, I did. So Anthony wrote us about this. Really? The water in the African rift lakes is not brackish, but it is hard. Meaning it's had a lot of minerals to solve it. A quick and easy way to add minerals to aquarium water for yeah, okay. African rift lake cichlids is to use kosher and Epsom salts. Okay. One teaspoon of each for five gallons. Calcium carbonate gravel also... Oh, increases right. the hardness and alkalinity. Sure. For the TWIP 105 case study, the fish consumed from Lake Victoria might not have been a cichlid, right. but that reminder of colonial mismanagement, the Nile perch. Which was an introduced species. Introduced. Yeah. Crazy. And if it were a cichlid, it quite likely was an introduced tilapia. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Uh-huh. When fish eat brine shrimp infested with cestodes, will the fish become victims of the parasites? If it's not a natural host, no. No. Because this is a bird ch- a, a cestode. So right. a fish versus a bird, those are quite different animals. And finally, he says, twips have been especially great since the uh, introduction of Dr. Griffin. Exactly. Thank you. Especially great. Exactly. Now that'll, make, that'll make him stick around. So, <laughs> I, meant, I meant to ask you before as yeah. to whether you considered a rectal biopsy hindsight. <laughs> that, is, that is clever. You know, Dixon... <laughs> You are really something it, else. I'll be totally different tomorrow, but today I feel pretty good. All right. Gonna, let's do a paper. We have a paper that- uh, That sounds good. We do. It's published in the Journal of Parasitology. Uh, listen, it, this is a great pick. This is a great <laughs> and this has no molecules in it. 
It's all morphology. It's a wonderful pick. Well, it's not just that. It's 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 a lot of other things too. Well, it has morphology and attacking. It's, what what it else? Has, um, sociology. And I like they crack the shells open with a hammer. Gently. They gently. Oh, I gently love that. Yeah, I, I yeah I love the gently, gently, gently. crack them open with the. <laughs> Was, I, I underlined certain parts of those. So, yeah, so I'm a member of the American Society of Parasitology. Are you as well, Dixon? A card, I card used to member. be. I used to be. <laughs> Why don't they sponsor TWIP? Uh, you have to ask them. I think they have no money. <laughs> They're a cash rich we organization. We don't need very much. <laughs> this is true. We do work for fairly low wages here. This is called Social Organization in Parasitic Flatworms for Additional. Echinostomoid trematodes have a soldier cast, and one does not. That, that title is very interesting, and one does not. It's and very unusual. Not. It's very unusual yeah. for a title, don't you think? Uh, very unusual. This comes from Santa Barbara. Where else can you go out and catch these <laughs> California snails? Snails, and, and sure. have a beautiful environment in which to do it. Exactly. Garcia Vedren, Quintana de Rogatis, Martin Curis, and Heckinger. Now, Dixon and, yes. and, uh, Daniel, and Daniel too. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, if what is this about casts? I've never heard of casts in terms of parasites. Uh, Explain, please. Uh, well, what is a cast? I know they have them in India. Well, they name them different. after the uh, other casts. For instance, bees, termites, worker bees, any social group of insects. Do we have casts in humans? Plaster casts, mostly. I think. Dr. Griffin usually administers well, plaster. I, I, I do think we do actually. It's it's sort of a it's a, almost a bureau, bureaucratic specialization. You have I'm certain people so. and they do this job. Other people do another yeah, job. And but, but it's not but, as rigid as the one in yeah, but these India. casts. The this is like a casts, biologically enforced. Yeah, caste the worker system. casts do not reproduce. Right. That's right. So it reminds us, I think, a lot of bees when we read this termites, um, paper. I and thought, they also I say uh, <laughs> shrimp, snapping shrimp, and naked mole rats. Yes. Right, right. What a sight! Naked mole rats. Exactly. <laughs> They're weird-looking animals, to so, say the least. They basically want to look here for more casts among so, these uh, trematodes, Dixon. But the question is, go ahead. Why? Ah, uh, well, I would like to begin this discussion. Please let me answer my question. Fine. I, no. Well, I know I he's, he's you going can't on. answer why questions in biology. All right. So let's not even. Who go cares? <laughs> oh, you'll see. You will. will? See. Why do we care? But, but what you have to know first. Will this save lives? No, no, no. You have another show, don't you? Isn't it about evolution? I do. Well, that's what this is about. I see. You maybe you make the so evolutionary now there's a conclusions at the end. That's yeah, fine. But, but what? I don't think they what did the audience, job, but... listening audience, needs to know first. Yes. Is something about the biology of schistosomes and the biology of trematodes in general. Hey, didn't we just do a schistosome case? We did. We did, but we didn't really cover the. All last right, side. do it. Okay, so that's it. Time's up. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> so the adult worms live in various hosts, and they live in various places in various hosts. So not all of them, like the schistosomes, live in the blood supply. But many others live in the gut tract or live in the bile, bile duct or can even live in liver tissue or live even on the outside of tissues near uh, where waste products exit. Like, for instance, in reptiles in the cloaca. Okay, they, you can have external apparently external parasites, but they're actually not quite external. They're just on the inside of the uh, cloacal opening. But they all have something in common, and that is that they all need an intermediate host to complete their life cycle. And that intermediate host is invariably a snail. Mm -hmm. Okay, so snails are the targets for the stage that lives inside the egg that mm -hmm. exits from the parasite. Mm -hmm. Okay. How interesting. <laughs> How very interesting. Because there are many, 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 many different kinds of snails. And what do we call someone who studies snails? Medignian? <laughs> Digenian? Keep going. No, those are the parasites. What do you call a guy who <laughs> studies the snails? The woman? They're called malacologists. Are you serious? Malacologists. That's right. Malacologists. Yep. Malacologists. How do you spell that? M-A-L-A-C-O-L-O-G-I-S-T. Wow. Malacologists. I knew several. <laughs> well, because you hang out with these people at meetings, right? They and I was at a biological station where there were nails. at least four malacologists working on various snails. Okay. Okay. So, but if you're going to wipe out this infection, let's say you're interested in wiping out just a somiasis, 
There was an attempt once to wipe, wipe out, out the snails. snails. Oh boy, was that that was such a horrendous program. Why? And, well, because they had no they had no other kinds of drugs. Basically, this was back in the sixties yeah. in Egypt. They wanted to poison the entire Nile River and wipe out all of the snails that carried schistosomes. <laughs> and it didn't work, of course. But that's beside the point. There was a there was a story in China where Mao wanted to wipe out all the snails oh, yeah. um, because he had a bit of a history. They they went to invade Formosa, oh yeah, and while his troops were training, they all ended true. up with Kadiyama fever. They all ended that's up horribly right. ill, and they you know there's a story that those are two the, islands, the disease that saved Formosa, which is Taiwan. That's so he came up during his um, stint running the show over there with this idea that you know they have a lot of labor so everybody needs to go find snails and get them out of the water and smash them and bury them <laughs> right but <laughs> in fact the poster that we're referring to actually shows you how to do that for the canals mm -hmm. which were used to bring water for the rice paddies so okay so that's another story the point is that the, that the snail is the, uh, the main focus of attention when it comes to trying to break the life cycle without the use of drugs or vaccines okay so a lot of people study snails for that reason so in this paper, they're looking at the casts within a single snail, right? Yeah, so what happens is that the egg hatches, right? And then a little swimming stage comes out. It's a free-living stage. This parasite has a free-living mm -hmm. stage, and that's called a myricidium. Mm -hmm. Okay, now in some cases, myricidium will find um, freshwater snails, but for saltwater life cycles, you've got this California snail along the coast, okay, as, as the main host. So one snail host could harbor multiple species of schistosomes, or, or of, of uh, uh, in this case, trematodes. Right, so the snails are living on the coast. Where do they get? Where do the uh, Myricidia come from initially? From yeah, other well, snails? which animal? No, they're an intermediate host. Right? They are an intermediate host. So the eggs have to come from the definitive host. So you have What's to ask that? yourself on the beach, what would that be? Well, no, maybe they're fish. They could have fish trematodes, for instance, or birds, shore birds, or birds, or, or reptiles, those, those, like turtles. Those things that lie on the beach, flapping their arm. What are those things called? Seals. Seals. Could they have them? Sure, of course they could. They sit there and throwing up the sand. <laughs> have you ever seen them? Sea you would have to. You would have to actually look up. Sea lions, Each right. one of these species of okay. echinostomes to find it. out what the definitive host was. But it's not human fecal contamination. No, this not is in Santa Barbara, and we don't do that That's over right. there. No, we, don't, we would never think of that. And these are not human. These are not human. They're not human. No, no these are animal models parasites. for human. I understand. Right. I understand. But one of the snails that they used in this study was the definitive snail host for Schistosoma mansoni because it's easy to raise. <clears throat> it's called uh, Biumfilaria glabrata. What? <laughs> You, there you go. Say See, that again. <laughs> Biumfilaria glabrata. Yeah, that's wow. the name of this Very snail. It's the one that's found commonly throughout Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. Dominican Republic, St. Lucia, all those places. Now, if but I maybe there's an important point there. I'll say that the snails can harbor lots of different trematodes, yeah. but most trematodes have a restriction to either one or very few types of snails. Correct. Mm -hmm. So here we have a condition where... Multiple parasites hone in on the same snail, snail species. Don't they kill each other? Well, that's what that's, this paper is all about. That's what happens. But they previously, eat, they exactly eat each what other. this paper is about. <laughs> previously, so that's one thing. Previously, they had shown that these uh, trematodes exist in casts, and they just wanted to find more, right? And they wanted to see how they do it also. But um, So there are two things here. There are casts, but then they're also killing other species as well, right? And I presume the worker is the one who no, does no, that, No, no, those right? are the same thing. The casts they result in... Uh, killers, in this case, soldier classes. Which would kill a different species, yes. right? Yes. So how do they Then there's a reproductive the cast, right? That and then there's the reproductive cast. That's right. weird. Why would you do that? So I can't we ask why. why. What's the function of having no. a an army versus a reproductive population? Yeah, well, you you know, it's too bad you couldn't get someone like E. Olson on your show to actually explain that in detail for ants because he knows, he knows all answer. those answers. He sure does. Is he alive? <laughs> oh, yeah. How old is he? He's in his 80s. Where does he work? Harvard. Harvard? He probably wouldn't talk to us. No, right? he might. You never know. I introduced him here once to a lecture, so I got to talk right. to him. He's a very nice man. Um, the point is that you have to understand what the life cycle is to understand this paper. Okay, so that's not the life cycle so far. I just told you what happens when the myricidium Go ahead. seeks the snail out by following a chemical trail mm -hmm. that tells it, it's heading for the right snail species. Are you saying desperately seeking snail? I am. That could be the name of this <laughs> this episode, but I have some other titles too. <laughs> so the 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 myricidium 
upon encountering the proper snail host, then attaches. So this sounds like, you know, a virus infection or a protozoan infection of a red cell. Mm. There's an attachment process, and then it secretes lytic enzymes, which allows it to penetrate through the foot of the snail. Got it. Now it's inside the snail, right? Mm -hmm. Now what the heck is inside of a snail? Does anybody here understand the anatomy of a snail? A gut tract. Uh, yeah, there is a gut tract, yes. Reproductive tract? There is a reproductive tract. Is there tract. a he hemoseal, the circulatory system? But it, has a, it has a very interesting way of getting fluids around throughout its body. How's that? Well, it, it has a circulation system, but it's not a, it's not a typical circulation. It's really an interesting mm -hmm. biological feature. But its digestive organs are the ones that I'm pointing to now okay. because gut it's the track. largest. That's the gut tract. No, no, no. That's just the tube that allows the food in. Now it has to digest the food, right? So what do we have for that purpose? In humans? Yeah. We have a stomach. And? I think we're getting to the hepatopancreas. Is that where we're going? Daniel hit that <laughs> nail right on that head. <laughs> so I we spent have too much time with Dixon. <laughs> liver, right? We've got liver. We've got pancreas. We've wait, got gallbladder. We've when got... When you digest things in your stomach, what's the source of the digestive enzyme? We don't enzyme? digest things too much in our stomach. We don't? It's, we acidify them and we... Pep we pepsinize You're them. There's no pepsin in this. Yeah, no, there's tons of pepsin. Okay, so what comes out of the stomach doesn't look like what went in, right? Of course, not. it's called chyle. It's, it's sort of they even have another name for it. It's sort of yeah. and ready and then, for all the bile salts. Well, the and, and you have bile salts and what else? Oh, you've got the secretions of the pancreas. You've got all those imogen granule contents. Okay. You've got RNAs, DNAs. Got it. You've got peptidases. You've got trypsin. You've got a whole bunch of other stuff that comes out into the gut tract that. Helps you digest every item of your food. So if you don't have a pancreas, Daniel, you have trouble digesting? <laughs> you, you die. It's, it's interesting. Well, yeah, <laughs> you do. But um, no, we, we run into this, right? Say someone is a heavy drinker, let's say, and they destroy their pancreas. A couple of things happen. One is we have issues controlling you know, insulin, sugar levels. But we also have um, a lack of pancreatic digestive enzymes. So we actually give people um, packets of Creon or pancreatic enzyme really? replacement. Oh. Otherwise, you can't break down a lot of the foods that have been homogenized and sort of prepped in the stomach. And if you don't do that, you will regret your next bowel Well, movement. it just moves through. You end up with diarrhea if you don't take your, mm -hmm. your Creon. Now, what does it have to do with casts? Well, because the, the target of this myricidium, once it penetrates the snail, mm -hmm. is the hepatopancreas. Okay. It's heading towards that organ. So Why? it even needs, oh, I'll get to that. It even <laughs> needs to follow chemical signals once it's inside the host. So not only does it find the snail host by following chemical trails, but once it's inside the snail, it's following other signals that tells it that it needs to go to the hepatopancreas okay. because it is the largest regenerative organ in the snail. And I'll, I'll emphasize that again. This organ probably consists of 90% stem cells. Hmm. Wow. All right. That's how reproductive this, okay. this cell is. And here's what happens next, too. The myricidium then transforms into the next stage of the infection. Mm -hmm. This is where the mystery starts, because you ask anybody that's involved in parasitism or parasitology that's studying eukaryotic parasites, studying worms, and you say, well, can you describe in detail what happens inside the hepatopancreas of a snail after it's infected with a trematode? And they'll just look at you like you're asking them, you know, can you describe the morphology mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the Martian landscape? It's a mystery. It's almost not studied. It's, it's a mystery organ as to what happens next. But what, what does happen next is the myricidium transforms to the sporocyst. Mm -hmm. That's the in, name in, they've in given the, this. In the hepatopancreas? In the hepatopancreas. Okay. The sporocyst then reproduces more sporocysts. Mm-hmm. And these are large items. These are not like little ciliated uh, paramecia-like organisms. These are fairly large worm-like structures. They're bags of more of themselves. So it's a clonal expansion, basically. From a single myricidium, you get clonal expansion. But in this case, the clonal expansion is bizarre. It's the next stage up, and they're producing more of themselves. You get more sporocysts to a point, then... They differentiate into the radius stage, R-E-D-I-A. Each mm -hmm. one is called a radius. Mm -hmm. The radius stage then, 
differentiates inside of itself to produce the stage that bursts out of the snail and infects the definitive host, namely the saccharia stage. So you've got three different things going on all at once inside the hepatopancreas of a snail. What the heck is all that about? There's a huge amount of resource, the hepatopancreas, that is put into production for all of these trematode life cycle stages. This process can occur over a two-year period, producing hundreds of thousands of saccharia. And the liver, hepatopancreas, just keeps regenerating itself to supply more supplies for Mm -hmm. these parasites. Now, one of the consequences of infection with trematodes in a snail is that it shuts down the reproduction of the snail. And it does that because the snail can only produce so much of each. Mm -hmm. So the parasite has been selected for life (laughs) to shut down the reproductive aspect of the snail so that all of the resources are devoted to regenerating the hepatopancreas, which then goes into supplying the parasite with the building blocks for its generations Mm -hmm. to come. Wow. It's it's a complicated story. It's 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 an amazing story. When you look at these forms isolated from each other they're bizarre shapes so which which of these stages are the casts existing the radia the r e d i a e the okay. radia stage some of them have mouths mm-hmm. and some of them don't and the ones that have mouths i think they have different size mouths yeah well they said that different but, size mouths relative to their body size okay fine okay fine <laughs> We have listeners picky, out there. They picky, will. Picky. You know, no, it's going to bring up these details. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you've read the paper. <laughs> I, I did read the paper. So the the worker cast. Well, the, there's no uh, worker cast here. This is a the soul. We'll call it the soldier. 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 Okay, soldiers. Soldiers. Yeah. They will not proceed to the next step. That's correct. Uh, anyway. They are differentiated into protecting against invasion from another species of trematode. That's remarkable. I think it's fantastic. It must mean that there's a big threat from invasion, right? There is. Uh, like I said, said there, before, are, there yeah. are thousands yeah. of different Neat. trematode species of marine animals, and there are very limited numbers of snail species. So this is a, under attack all the time, right? And remember... The snail that's infected doesn't reproduce. So that even limits further the amount of production that there can be from other species invading the snail. You know, other organisms deal with the same problem by giving all members the ability to either fight or reproduce. You know, we have immune systems this is true. that fight off parasites. This is very true. And we can still reproduce. So it's interesting that they're specialized. There must be some advantage, I suppose. Well, you know, you'd think so. But here they looked all over the place, and they could only find four examples from the echinostomes. Yeah. And one example from the biomphalaria, which is a freshwater snail, by the way, not a saltwater snail. So they picked a freshwater snail as, as a comparison, and that did not produce truly definable... Um, soldier classes, although some of them did behave like soldiers if mm-hmm. they were presented with another radia from another species. They would attack it, but they didn't uh, differentiate from producing their saccharia. So essentially in this paper, they collect snails, right? Yeah. In Santa Barbara. Yeah. And so, gently open them with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very funny, to dissect horn snails, we carefully crack the shell with a hammer. And carefully. The shell. <laughs> carefully. That's very funny. I think that was to avoid hitting their thumb. <laughs> How big are these snails? Like, um, I know I don't know the answer. Why don't we just type pair? out? No, I don't think they're that big. <laughs> well, let's type out their names and see. And what how do you got. catch them? You dig into the sand. They're along the shoreline. They're All like right. little. So tunnel. how do you distinguish? Do you do flow cytometry to separate workers from reproductive? No, they're they're quite remarkably different in their morphology. Morphological. Yeah, and you can see them under a dissection microscope. So we know already what a, a an army. Uh, ready, how do you call it? Redia. Redia looks like versus a reproductive redia. Yeah, because they're different sizes, and their mouths are clearly different in size as well. But they, they actually showed pictures in the uh, paper. Dixon, if you lumber, looked in lumber. the snails in Lake Victoria that we yeah. just talked about, yeah, would you sure. find casts as well? Uh, well, it's very interesting. Have they looked? The answer is probably not. Oh, interesting. Uh, so there's an author on this paper that I know very well, by the way. His name is Donald Heinemann. Mm-hmm. And Donald Heinemann and I are good friends. And he he worked at the University of California at Berkeley for many, many, many years and was uh, uh, a good a, a good citizen and uh, held office in the American Society for Parasitology. And uh, you'll never guess what he does now, by the way. He's retired, uh, of course, as many of us are. You know what he does now? He studies amber. He's written a wonderful book. It's called Life 
in amber. Where is she? I know it's not. Sorry, sorry, not that no, amber. But I'm bum. <laughs> no, no, no. He 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 almost single handedly popularized the notion that you could take blood from an insect yeah. in amber and make a dinosaur. And out make of a it. dinosaur out yeah. of it. Right. Sure. So he was sure. he was involved in that discussion. They, uh, Daniel, they collected two thousand six hundred and sixteen radiae from five trematoid species. It sounds like a lot. How many are in each snail? Do you think uh, it goes on for two years? <laughs> what He's goes on? The study making radia for two years. So oh, this is at the any given moment you've that. got a lot. But imagine how many has produced over time. Wow, it's a lot. So they look right? at them and they can say, "Oh, we have." We have army and non-army. That's right. So they said, ah, what this is. But then they also did this uh, attacking thing. They did. Say, they what put, is that? Does either of you know what that involves? Well, it's like putting one species of radia and then throwing in several other species. And you just watch them. And then watch them. And right? they, they and fight. They well, do. Apparently, the, the, they attach at the mouth. <laughs> oh, my God. Sort of look like How else? <laughs> No, but I thought it was interesting. I mean, it sort of a, looks like an evolutionary selection. It looks like maybe originally it was that the um, very early juvenile forms were the soldiers, yeah. and then they would mature. But then it seems like there was some evolutionary advantage to maintaining them in sort of this juvenile soldier stage and only allowing a certain number to mature to the adults. And the one, you know, as they say, the one that does not is a strain that they've been studying in the lab for 40 years. So there may right. be a certain, mm -hmm. um, okay. maybe a certain change. price you're, price you're change, paying yeah. for the specialization. And when yeah. there's no selective pressure to maintain it, you may be losing it. Um, so the lab strain may be, you know, an anomaly of 40 years of study right. in the lab, which right. maybe is a warning for a lot of, um, you know, mice and other animals that have been inbred and studied for years. They may lose sure. some of the qualities that animals in the wild possess. So what, is, what does this say about the success rate of going from one host to the next host, if you know that it has to produce two years worth of like 10 to 15,000 sicaria per day mm -hmm. for two years. What does that say about the success of this parasite? Well, I think they talk, and I think this was a good point, that because the infection is so chronic, once you're there, you're invested, and you're going through this match, you, mm -hmm. you need to basically protect your investment. And I think that's the that's evolutionary um, advantage of soldiers to basically keep out any invaders yeah. coming to take over your your food supply, your nest. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you make fifteen thousand a day, you said, or more in in, in one snail. Yeah, uh, where do they go? And they shed them into the. They environment. shed them constantly. That's correct. Got it, Dixon. They say here from the four species examined, yep. most radiae were found in the gonadal area. Now you're just telling us ah. that. They were in the hepatopancreas. Oh, no, but these are the guard. These are the ones that guard against invasion, though. Well, no, I think this is one. So initially, you go through as as Dixon was saying. Right. Um, initially, you go through this myricidium stage. You go to the sporocyst, but then when you get to the radia, at that point, you're no longer, I think, as um, mm -hmm. reliant on the hepatopancreas. Okay. And that's when you go. Okay. The reproductive ones are going to go to the gonads, where they're going to actually be releasing. Or um, maybe that's where they inhibit the reproduction of the snail too. That also is true. They do just inhibit the, the reproduction there. <laughs> Man, sort of a yummy rich area, but it's also a place where they can release yeah, no, that's true. the circaria okay. into the okay. into the water. They have a lovely photo of them them attacking yeah. another species yeah, here. Yeah. You're right. Biting, they attack biting biting the biting each other. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is this is you at work, Dixon, huh? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> so four species of of horn snails, California horn horned snails, now have a soldier cast. Right. Soldier cast. That's not a worker. It's a soldier, soldier. cast. That's right. yeah. Nice. But there are cool. like lots of ant species with soldier cast also. And, uh, but if you think about what do you, what do you do with this knowledge? Now, ideally, yeah. if you can have a trematode with a very aggressive um, soldier cast out competing mm -hmm. a human pathogen, a human parasitic trematode, then you don't have to even kill all the snow snails. You don't have to use toxic chemicals. You can basically out compete. Schistosoma mansoni, I'll compete hematobium. Yeah, well, so you're talking about a biological control agent. <laughs> I, I don't like labels. <laughs> yeah, but you'd have to accept that one, I'm afraid, because there's been a long yes. history of using biological control agents for disease um, amelioration, as it were, and it just doesn't seem to work out. You, you know, you achieve balances between the host and the parasite or the competitors and yeah. uh, Lodka and... Um, I'm blocking on the name of the other guy, but uh, there were two famous uh, ecologists that studied uh, predation in two different species of ciliates, 
And uh, they developed a whole series of theories about the way uh, predation occurs. And, and this is a predation thing, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not an exclusion because the other parasite doesn't know that the snail is infected until they get inside. And then they get bit. Which would have been a more interesting strategy <laughs> if the parasite could force the snail to give off the wrong pheromone. Then they could throw out a smoke screen and uh, forget about, oh, They wouldn't wait a have minute. to bite the other uh, tree What if we could genetically barbage? alter a snail to give off the wrong pheromone pattern? Yeah, I bet you could do that. With, but unfortunately, the, the pheromones <laughs> are necessary for the snails to find each other. Right. They so wouldn't be able to mate. <laughs> Listen to the name of this paper. We should... We should look at this. It's called Parasitic Castration, the Evolution and Ecology of Body Snatchers. Uh-huh. Wow. Uh, in the acknowledgments, they thank their field site for letting them go in and a lady named Kathy for access to a microscope and a camera. <laughs> Right. Which right. tells me, what are these guys doing otherwise <laughs> if they don't have a microscope or a camera? <laughs> Right? They're in the well, Department yeah. of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Yeah. They have a small budget. <laughs> or Kathy is a member of their department down the hall. Who knows? But if they don't have their own microscope, what can they do? They do field work. But how can you see if these guys are so small? Right? Uh, well, they picked a problem that they had, they had to, to see. Okay, for. very yeah. good. Anything else on this, gentlemen, before we... Yeah, I think well, that's pretty cool. It's interesting. It was, something uh, different, isn't it? Was it was a change of pace. A change of pace, were. but you seem to like it a lot. I did because it, there was a lot of biology in it, and I, I uh, adore biology, as you do. I know you and, do. And Daniel, you picked, it was an unusual pick for a physician, what was I your, must say. So I, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned I, I Are mentioned you pandering I'm to a, us? <laughs> no, no, I mentioned I, I'm a member of the American Society. So I, I read this journal every month. It's one of the ones that comes, and I go through, and I- um, oh, You get a hard copy. I get a hard copy. Uh, this is my copy in my hand. I tore it out of the heart. Yes, I read yeah. through it. And this is, I thought it was a really All interesting right, idea. Good stuff. Very good. Let's, uh, that's cool. We I, do I a do shout agree. out to John, to Donald Heinemann also for just uh, having such a varied career and making so many contributions at so many levels mm-hmm. at not only a parasitologist, but also this uh, new life of his in amber. Life in amber. Life in amber. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's do a case study. <laughs> All right. Oh, yes. I think you guys will like this case study. You, and by you guys, I don't just mean the two sitting here at this table that is not round. Um, guys is not a generic. <laughs> yes, I'm using that in all the human listeners and all the non-human listeners. Exactly. It's a degenderized. Um, okay. So this, this is a story that um, I heard from a colleague of mine who is an ophthalmologist in Switzerland. Super nice, super nice guy. His name is Florian. And so Florian tells me, and I think he, he keeps laughing as he's telling me the story, because it was a bit entertaining. And, and as we say, n- no, nobody came to any terrible harm. So maybe that's a hint. So the story is there's a woman from Switzerland, and she's in her early 20s, and she returns to Switzerland after a surfing vacation in North Africa. Now, she was surprised at how rustic her accommodations were when she <laughs> was there. Surfing vacation in Northern Africa? Northern you know? Africa. Okay. Yes. Um, and is she, it in the ocean or in the Mediterranean? Surf. Mediterranean we're, or we're ocean? Gonna, we're going to get you. We're, we're not at the point where you get to ask me questions. Love yet, bugging you. Know? You, you, you don't get to. Surf. I know. I know. I'm going to tell you guys. It's all good. <laughs> and the, the accommodations were uh, rough? So, the, the accommodations were a... Um, a lot more rustic than she expected. She said there were lots of animal and insect exposure. Nice. She actually said she'd wake up and just be like covered in flies and stuff. She was was a little shocked. Surfing must have been terrific. Yeah, it was a a surfing camp, theoretically. But Ah. no, there were no screens. Everything was open. Um, She, yeah, she said she she ate a bunch of different things. She had some loose stools while she was trying to enjoy her vacation. (laughs) And now she's concerned because her left eye is starting to bother her. Mm. Um, She says that her left eyelid is swollen with some swelling around the eye and reports that the left eye is red. Did you tell us how long she was there or you haven't gotten to that part yet? (laughs) I don't think I got to that part. Oh, okay, fine. Um, Now she is most distressed because she thinks she has seen things moving around in her eye. And a previous, more senior ophthalmologist reassured her, gave her some eye drops, and she was not reassured. And she's now being seen for a second opinion. 
Um, and a couple of the things I will, I'll give you right off. I mean, first, I'm going to let you know that she's a healthy woman with no medical, surgical, allergy, family history. So very clean background. Right. She doesn't take any medications. Right. Um, she is a student. Right. Um, lives by herself in her own domicile. She right. only drinks occasional alcohol, but um, not excessive. Um, Does she have age? AIDS? She does everything herself. No, she does not. Have AIDS? No. She does not have a <coughs> HIV infection. Has she had all her immunizations? Yes, normal. Where is she um, from? So her travel geographic history, as we mentioned, she's she's Swiss, mm -hmm. um, and she was just surfing in Morocco, a number of Morocco. miles outside of Casablanca. Morocco. So that's the Mediterranean. Yeah. So actually, apparently, there is a surfing area Ch there. Who wouldn't guess that? Morocco. 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 So this is northern, I guess, western Africa. Just the Mediterranean, right? Yes. Can you give us a checklist of animals that she said she saw? Um. So, let's see. She actually she saw lots of animals: dogs, sheep, dogs. rodents, yeah. lots of flies, lots, uh, lots of, of flies. insect exposure. Which kind of flies? Um. She doesn't know. Mosquitoes? Ones that were landing on her face. She Get bitten by mosquitoes? She I said know. she got lots of insect bites. Lots of insect bites. She was not happy about that. Probably some stable flies also. Stable flies? What's a stable fly? Stomoxus calcitrans. Yeah. It is a nasty little yeah. dipterin. And apparently, as I'm trying to give you guys a sense of the environment, um, picture that, you know, here she is outside the city. It's a relatively rural um, agricultural community. Um, right. As mentioned, there's a lot of animal husbandry going on. There's this very interesting Barbary sheep, right, in the oh, area. Absolutely. So sort of picture this picturesque uh, agricultural area, and you're staying in very limited rustic dwellings with no screens. Like and, sleeping with the animals. But basically. the surfing is good. <laughs> right. But tell me how long she was there again. Um, she was there for a couple weeks. couple. And this is... Afterwards. I believe it was a two week. I it was a two week. And when, when did she this see her a, physician? This is about a week. Um, this is about a week after she gets back. So three weeks um, then. Well, she's there for two weeks. And now she's been back for about a week. And she sees moving things in her eyes. Yes. And but she the ophthalmologist has, uh, doesn't see them? Well, she saw the senior ophthalmologist who looked and said, no, I don't see anything. Nothing, there, um, yeah. nothing to worry about. Here are some drops. How did he look? Um, so he, they, it's interesting. They do these, um, it's like a hand lens. So it's a certain magnifying lens. Let's say it's about, I don't know, three centimeters in diameter. And you hold it up and, you know, you darken the room and use a light and it allows oh. you to magnify and inspect. Um, because she's describing this on the surface of the eye. So he, yeah, he does, he does both. He does a fundoscopic exam where he dilates and looks in the back. He doesn't see anything there. No, see anything. no, no. So he does. So oh, okay. he does the fundoscopic um, examination. Um, doesn't see anything there. And he looks, doesn't see anything um, on the conjunctiva. Does she have any other uh, signs or symptoms? Have a rash or anything like that? No, it's Nothing. all localized it's all the to eye. the left. To the left. What does she eye. say she sees? <laughs> she says she feels little tiny things moving around. See, she, she, little she, tiny things. Little tiny things. Does she see these as shadows occasionally? No, no. So she doesn't see them through the eye. She sees them moving on the surface of her eye when she looks in the mirror. And she says they appear to be these tiny um, objects. She doesn't describe them as worm-like. They're tiny little things, and they're moving around. She sees them moving around, and she's very upset. Mm. And her eye is, is obviously irritated and red, as is the eyelid. Indurated. She has monoorbital edema. She does have swelling around that left eye, but it's really more the eyelid itself rather than so much around. Okay. So she had lots of insect bites, right? And she does and, report a lot. And she stayed in accommodations which were on the beach or in the forest or... Well, They're actually right by the beach, right? Right by this, the beach? Yep. Right on the beach. No trees, right? I don't actually think there are any trees. I think it's mostly like a low shrub type um, environment. And this developed on her return, correct? She noticed it when she came back. She did have her red eye before that, though, or not? She didn't notice that it was oh, red okay. until she got all back. Right, all right, all right. And um, did she see anybody else after that? Well, she saw the first senior um, ophthalmologist. Yeah. Gave her some And drops. he said it drops. And then she was not happy with that. No. So she comes back and now she's seeing 
our friend Florian, ah. the youngest member of the ophthal- of the Swiss ophthalmology group. And this is where you get the diagnosis. And uh, he's going to examine her, and he's going to tell her what's going on. Mm. Right. No bloods or anything, right? Just going to look at it and so, figure it out. So uh, the senior guy did a bunch of blood work to uh, would reassure her, and all the all blood the, work all normal, came right? back negative. And the eye is still red? The eye is still red. How many weeks now? Um, so or it wasn't much longer. It was just a few days after oh. the scene. And she's like, I got to see some. So, right, I don't, so I don't the, trust that. She sees these <laughs> things in the mirror, but nobody else could see them, right? Yes. Mm. Or she actually sees them in the mirror. Yes. That's what she reports. She reports that when she looks in the mirror, she can see these small things moving around but on the no one else surface of her eye. Oh, the Florian sees, said, does well, he, Florian agree with her that he can see something? We will. That will be the final thing. I will tell you whether or not he sees something. Um, and there are multiple <laughs> small things moving around? That's what she says. There are uh, several. Okay. All right. Okay. Does he so, see them? Do you have any other questions before? Because the final thing, I will tell you whether or not Florian sees them. Um, if, you know, I've, again, I have to go back on my experience as a technician here and as a, as a sort of a fly on the wall, no pun intended. I like that one. (laughs) Because I, I listen to what other people tell me that they've seen too. And (laughs) usually when someone starts to see things like this, um, they're coming out of orifices or they're collecting them and they're bringing them into the uh, lab for diagnosis. And they're usually pieces of string or there's not, there's no basis for their uh, fears except the psychological fear. Okay. So you think about entomophobias uh, and things like this, but this is obviously not one of those cases because one eye is affected. The other eye is not affected. So it's a real thing. I would accept that as a real thing. And, uh, okay, let's ask whether Florian Okay, so the final, the final thing I will tell you, mm-hmm. this, this, will, this will hopefully give people um, the information they need, <laughs> is that to humor the young lady, mm-hmm. um, our kind Swiss physician decides he's going he's gonna to do a thorough inspection. And he is surprised to see <laughs> several tiny mobile objects they are moving around actually rather rapidly he describes them <laughs> and they appear to be headed towards the lacrimal duct really so he quickly grabs um an instrument that he has on hand and he is able to grab to catch to grab I believe there were three of these in total he's oh, okay. able to grab them before they get either they're desperately trying to get into the lacrimal duct and these are, he describes it only about a millimeter, right? So he's doing this under magnification and he is, he plucks three of them off and then we're going to actually get to see what these look like under a microscope. Very cool. So these are. I think I have the diagnosis. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I, th- I thought I did, but it's not right because they're too small. What was your diagnosis? I, I, <laughs> well, we will we will let our let's let Since, our listeners let's let our listeners think and research. we will talk off camera. Yeah, we'll is it talk were? off camera? All right, very good. That's a great case. Terrific. All right, let's do some the, email. The, the thing I love about these cases is that <laughs> not only do you find out about the parasitic infection, but you get the sociology of it also. Mm. I mean, whoever knew there was surfing in Morocco? Who would ever know there were people well, actually, that would go to Morocco I, just I, to surf? I don't care. And then, <laughs> who would ever guess that people would Although, put up with such abhorrent conditions yeah, and no. still stay for the whole time? Although, weeks. I could see Daniel going to surf there. You know, he likes to do this yeah, sort of thing. I've done, I, I've done some work. I did this surfing trip one time. It was the southernmost part of Mexico. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was... Um, How about Yishkalak? It was So it was east of Puerto Escondido. <laughs> And uh, it was great surfing. Yeah. I was much younger in that day. And I, I, you know, let's say my judgment was always not as good as, well, it could be or it should be. On the Gulf side or on the Pacific side? So it's the Pacific side. Uh-huh. It's the southernmost part. And amazing surfing. And we went down. We were in a four-wheel drive. <laughs> we were camping on the beach. We, so you were a surfer, dude? I, <laughs> I, I, I'm a horrible surfer. But, uh, but it was exciting. It was fun. Now you surf the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> My middle child actually has a knack. She was the first time she tried surfing, she was right up. Wow. And so she's a natural. Wow. So I'll I'll take her to Morocco. Email. <laughs> sure. Sherry writes from a former Alaskan with Hunter Fisher patients. The minute you said Alaska, I said beaver fever. 
otherwise known as gyrodiasis. It's interesting. So we have two guesses for last week that came in late. I think this is correct because this is the only parasite I've ever heard Alaskans getting, and it is known <laughs> to come from drinking from natural streams which carry the parasites from wild animals. I've known several people with this disease, and I'm not a parasite expert, but from the symptoms, including muscle pain, 30% eosinophils, and stories from hunters, I'm hoping I might be right. Thanks. I love the show. Cherry is a PhD student at Portland State University in the Center for Life in Extreme Environments. And I happen to know that we have a, f a friend virologist there, Ken Stedman. Nice. All right, so she was wrong. She um, <laughs> it was it was trichinella. Dixon. The next one is also a guess. Why don't you take Alina's? So we do Alina. Can you right? do that, Alina? Here you go, Dixon. I'm going to set you up here. Oh, okay, because I had to. You win. look a little helpless, Dixon. <laughs> I, you know, come on, I'm getting on an age here. <laughs> Elena writes, "Hello, all. I'm an American studying medicine in the Philippines." It's an ongoing adventure. This is not the place for someone with OCD tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> I had a micro teacher in undergrad micro, medical micro in Berkeley who were, required us to listen to the older podcasts Oh, as part of the curriculum, and we would discuss it in class. So I returned to TWIP when I found I was having a hard time paying attention in a lecture. I'm very thankful for the podcast because they bring these bugs to life, and it's more fun this way. I'll have to go with this case. Oh, no, I'll have a go at this case, since it's like a mini-review for finals. That's probably right. History revealed the patient ate bear meat, made me think of Trichinella spiralis. Normally, the sample used is pork, but I remember a black bear on a life cycle image from the CDC. Ingested insisted larvae mature to adults, which mate and produce live larvae, which burrow out of the intestine, into the blood system, through the mesenteric vessels, and jump out and insist in muscle tissue. This activates the immune system, causing inflammation, edema, increased white blood cells, fever, and myalgia. Uh, physical examination findings of bilateral periorbital swelling is consistent with trichinella. Elevated muscle enzymes, lactate dehydrogenase, and creatine kinase, suggesting muscle injury or myopathy support the diagnosis. According to the Ketzrung textbook, the migration lasts one month and has a predilection for high active muscle tissues, including the diaphragm, tongue, masseters, intercostals, and extraocular muscles. I guess highly active because of the increase in blood flow. Absolutely correct, by the way. I guess we could go to a muscle biopsy. I don't know if there would be enough muscle left over if a biopsy were done on the extraocular muscles. You <laughs> probably wouldn't think about diagnosing that way. Treat with steroids and mebendazole or albendazole. How do doctors decide between mebendazole or albendazole? Is it based on the patient or whatever is available? Other parasites to consider. Diphelobothrium latum or schistosomiasis. From drinking the river water and ingesting the salmon, which is caught in freshwater rivers. Borrelia burgdorferi from deer ticks while walking around in the woods hunting bear. Non-parasite differentials. Dermatomyositis, which occurs in children or adults, may be caused by autoimmune response, presenting with bilateral proximal muscle weakness, skin rash of the upper eyelids, and periorbital edema. Liver cirrhosis, secondary alcoholic liver disease, or hepatitis, which can cause myalgia, diarrhea, and edema. Poor nutrition can cause muscle pain and edema, though if this is June, it wouldn't, wouldn't there be vegetables available? I lived in Alaska when I was small, and we had peas in the backyard. Coliform bacteria. Maybe the water source was contaminated somehow, so both husband and wife became infected. That's how I got my monthly diarrhea. <laughs> I personally don't mind the side comments since, for me, it's funny to listen to. Thank you for sharing and teaching microbiology. So how do you decide between mebendazole and albendazole? You know, the um, albendazole has better tissue penetration. So if, let's say you're going to treat a neurosister sarcosis in the brain, you'd go with albendazole. Mm, in a lot of regions, there's an issue of availability or cost. So that might, that might be. But albendazole, I think of as a better tissue penetrator. Michael writes, hello, doctors. Twip, thank you for the fantastic show. I love them all. I particularly love the new case reports, even though I never write in. I do enjoy thinking about them. <laughs> I really enjoyed Michael Libman's case of trypanosomiasis. He was a great guest, and you should definitely get him back soon. I'm writing in now with some comments on your conversation on gene drives. First off, I would like to respond to Chandran's letter about gene drives. 
Chandran stated that Vincent's concern that the cast gene could acquire a mutation and thus evolve around the gene drive system was a non-issue as the broken gene would just be replaced in subsequent generations by cast genes from the other parent. He is absolutely right about this, but the entire conversation misses the fact that most gene silencing does not happen by mutations in protein coding sequence, but in regulatory sequence. In the simplest case, if the gene drive locus did not include the promoter upstream of CAS, a mutation of that promoter would silence the entire locus irrespective of how many times a functional CAS sequence was swapped in by the CRISPR system. It would be easy enough to include the upstream promoter, as they did in the paper you discussed, in the CAS sequence. However, there are many other repressive mechanisms that could do the same thing. For example, acquiring some nearby runs of CGs would lead the whole region, both alleles, to be methylated and permanently silenced. This leads me to the next point that came from the same letter. Should we intentionally make a few species of mosquitoes extinct? My personal opinion is no. I don't think that we are smart enough to know all the ecological consequences of that action. And one needs only glance at Australia to see that our prior history of intentional ecological tampering for the greater good is not a great one. However, regardless of that, I personally feel that I w it would be impossible in this case. Anopheles gambii has a population size in the billions spread across several continents with a very short generation time. A sterility gene drive is just about as powerful of a selective pressure possible. Do we really think that that could possibly work? Even if evolving around the gene drive is a low probability event, we are still talking billions of possible chances for it to happen. I think this would be a very interesting topic for you to discuss with Nelson on, with Nels on Twebo. On the other hand, the gene drive in the paper you discussed just targets malaria. That could possibly give the mosquito a selective advantage and thus actually work. Although then there's pressure for the parasite to evolve quickly. Maybe we should do both. We could make the population crash and then release a second gene drive that makes the few remaining mosquitoes immune to plasmodium. That would have a decent chance of actually getting rid of the malaria parasite completely, particularly if we combined it with a very well-funded effort to treat everyone with latent malaria. Also, Vincent, I wouldn't be so certain that these mosquitoes will never be released. The burden of malaria is enormous, and I think people would consider it. If some random lab did, it would be a disaster. But if a UN panel of mosquito and malaria endemic countries was convened and they voted to release the mosquitoes, I actually think it could happen. Malaria is just such a huge deal in so much of the world. The weather here at Stanford is 18C, 63% humidity, and overcast. We are finally getting a Good series of storms in California, and we actually have a flash, flash flood warning. Plus, we are supposed to get four feet of snow in the mountains this weekend, which is exciting. <laughs> it is a strange winter, though, because we are finally getting a lot of precipitation, but the snow line is very high, so we aren't getting the huge buildup of snow at lower elevations that usually makes for a good summer water supply. Sorry for the very long email, but thank you for covering this very interesting topic and for running such a great set of podcasts. Also... Congratulations on the new website, Vincent. I really liked it a lot. All the best, Mike. Okay, very interesting. You guys remember the Gene Drive paper? Yes? All right, let's go over the whole thing now, Dixon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I remember it. I so remember this is interesting. There, there are other ways that it could mutate, but he, he says it's a low-frequency event, and, and he's right about that. Um, so, uh, yes, I think you probably are right. We, we did this, I think, before Zika was getting crazy, and now they're talking of doing a mosquito release in the Florida <laughs> Keys uh, mm -hmm. of a modified Aedes aegypti that, when it mates, the offspring are dead, basically. And um, so I think that will happen. I I agree with him that we shouldn't wipe out a species, though. We don't know the consequences. We're good at it. Come on. But we are good at it, yes. <laughs> We've done it in We have done it before, all our lives. <laughs> and I don't think this will stop us. No. Listen, if we got rid of all the mosquitoes in the world, what would happen? Horrible. There, there's a lot of disease control that goes on because of them. Not for us, per se, but lots of yeah. mosquito diseases go to animals that control their population. So I think parasitic diseases are the control elements that keeps populations in check. And the moment you release that then you're really going to screw up ecology. I mean, it just, it'll be a mess. Aren't we like driving so many species to extinction? This would be just a question of deciding which one. Well, if we could ever <laughs> decide which one would be a genius, but we can't, that's the problem. I mean, every time they cut down a tree in South America, they extinct, I'm sure, some species that were specific to just that one place. Yeah. That's how, the, that's how specific these things are. All right, one more, which is also from Anthony, who sends us a paper. <laughs> which 
you will find familiar. Yes. T. Gandhi <laughs> infection relationship with aggression in psychiatric psychiatric subjects. Isn't it the one that our friend just sent us? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the one our friend. It's sent. about um, according to this. Uh, according to this, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> according to this. Uh, seropositivity for a T. Gandhi was associated with higher aggression and impulsivity scores. <laughs> and um, the problem, of course, is that, as Dixon has said, everyone in the world is nearly infected with T. Gandhi, yeah, right? So it's hard to ascribe a certain effect in this population. But they may have other confounding things that we're not looking at here, right? Possible. I mean, it's everything is possible, right? You can't ignore it because it is a working hypothesis, but... We had John Boothroyd on our show. Come on, and John Boothroyd. He said he didn't believe it. Now, Dixon, That's if you took the, is there any way to take someone who has Toxo and cure it? Well, unfortunately, the stage that is in the brain that you wish you could get rid of is Can't. not a dividing stage. So, that so there's no way to hit it. There's right? no drug that will affect it. Okay, but but mm. if you were willing to take the risk, you could immunosuppress that person. So that it did go back into a dividing stage and then quickly treat. So the, that the shock no and tissue. kill. Yeah, shock and kill. That's right. So I mean, that would be one way to do. It. I mean, if if this person were suffering from a neurologic disorder as severe as schizophrenia, if it could ever be proven, of course, then the cure would be to immunosuppress that person and at the same time give anti-parasitic drugs that could cross the blood-brain barrier. And kill off the parasites before they had a chance to cause more damage. And hopefully yeah. the brain would repair itself. Ha, ha, ha. Could you do such a study? Uh, no, I don't, would I ever don't think people would, yeah. They would never approve that. I don't that. think people would approve that. I mean, also, these are people with long-term issues. And I don't know that you can just, you know, treat and it'll go away overnight. Right? And are you going to consent this population well, for such a risky yeah. endeavor? This is, this is the most widely spread infection on Earth. It affects lots of different animals. Yeah, the mouse behaves differently because it loses its sense of smell and it can't smell the cat urine. That's the reason why they're captured, not because they go crazy. Mm -hmm. The cats don't go crazy because they're loaded with toxo. I don't know of any example of an animal that's, that says, ah, the, the reason why this animal is, is crazy or, or acting bizarrely is because they're infected with toxoplasmosis. I, I don't know any study that says Hey, let me read their conclusion. We report a greater rate of T. Gandhi seropositive status in subjects with DSM-5 IED compared with healthy controls and a positive relationship with aggression and anger, but not with depression and anxiety. These findings are consistent with previous seropositive status data, suggesting a relationship with self-directed aggression and a relationship involving schizophrenia or mania. Our results further add to the complexity of impulsive aggression from both a categorical and a dimensional perspective, but they don't say what to do about it. So the prevalence rates, you could do an epidemiologic study here and easily debunk this this paper because, <laughs> because half of France, maybe more than half of France, 80% of France is infected with this parasite. Yeah, I think France and Brazil are 80%. The U.S. were about an, 20%. And it's, it's, it's fallacious to think that that schizophrenia is more prevalent in France than it is anywhere else in the world. I think the rates are about the same. And so there's no correlation between toxoplasma and infection. So, so in why that do sense, you think in their study they had, had correlation no, with seropositivity? No no, you know, that might be an epiphenomenon that has nothing to do with each other. Yeah, of course. These are just odd correlations that, that, that yes. happen to fall of out. Of course, like we know that correlation is not causation. Exactly right. You know, I have a slide that I show the number of movies... Nicholas Cage has been in, which <laughs> right. correlates perfectly with the number of deaths by drowning in swimming pools. But of course, but of course, but of course. So correlation is not causation. No, it certainly isn't. But people are really hung up on this toxo I know they are. I mental know. illness thing, I know. aren't they? They are. Why? Um, well, it's the same as when they were hung up on the, uh, the autism being caused by a vaccination. I, I think they're looking for a cause for things. And, and, the moment something suggests that that might be the cause, there are groups of people willing to fall behind that sort of leader of a parade of we need more money for, you know, and then you get these uh, bandwagoning type of situations, which is not good. And, you know, I won't say that it's not without validity because obviously the AIDS epidemic was a good example of, of ignorance and uh, oblivion 
to a problem which could have been solved very quickly if they had listened and they didn't listen. And as a result, this is what happened. So, so these other groups take notice of that and say, well, it's for, true for us too, but it may not be. That's the other thing. It just may not be. So um, I am empathetic and sympathetic, but you have to show me more evidence than this kind of a correlation. What else could they do? Well, they can go to places where the incidence of toxoplasma is extremely high and see whether or not the rates of schizophrenia are higher, too. They can do that, but they don't talk about that. Because in France, that's that would be I, – I would do these studies in France or in some of the Native American populations up in the Arctic because mm-hmm. almost everybody's infected up there. But judging whether or not it's a causative agent for this or not, I mean, you'd have to do a, 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 a vertical study, too. Uh, from age zero to five, from age five to 10, from 10 to 20, and find out where the age group is most important that, that acquires this infection. When do patients become diagnosed with schizophrenia typically? Right in 16? Um, it tends to be late teens, early 20s. It's right. often the, yeah. the, the child leaves for college, let's say, right. or university, right. and then bizarre behaviors. Notice. There was an interesting study where they had a bunch of psychiatrists review um, films of family birthday um, parties Mm -hmm. and they actually were able to sort of pick up that probably the earliest symptoms are starting about five or six years of age oh really but then the clinical the full-blown clinical manifestation probably is triggered by a certain stage in maturation Um, so we don't i mean that's sort of an issue is if you're trying to say that this um, infection causes schizophrenia we're not thinking that you know this correlation um so here's a I mean, this has been going on for a while. Here's a 2003 paper. They say France, which has a high prevalence of toxo, was reported to have first admission rates for schizophrenia approximately 50% higher than in England. Ireland also has a high rate of toxo-infected persons in rural areas. Uh, And then um, the area of our study in Ireland also has been reported to have a high prevalence of schizophrenia. But, um, you know, these are all correlations again, right? What is the typical number that you would give for a you know, hundred thousand people in the United States, let's say how many people have schizophrenia in a hundred thousand in a hundred thousand. Oh, okay. Um, to pick another number, but it's usually per no, like thousand. what percent now we're probably down a, a close to 1%. It's one. much more common than people realize, I think. Um, but I would say, you know, this, this paper, I actually looked through this paper a little bit before the show because yeah. Yossi is a buddy of mine. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I, even though there are papers where they've drawn this connection with schizophrenia, this paper I think was much more as far as um, aggression, not necessarily in the context of schizophrenia. Because I, I, okay. I find it very right. hard um, to accept a connection with um, a particular defined psychiatric disease such as um, yeah, schizophrenia, yeah, yeah. but I could see it having subtle impacts upon impulse control, anger, things like that. Doesn't it depend um, on the area of the brain that's infected, though? I mean, this is random stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think this is all interesting, but it's still, none, none of it's gotten to the point where it's a compelling, um, solid story. But it's right. been going on a long time. People have been pursuing this yeah, for The moment they ages. found out that that mouse got his behavior changed, they wanted everything yeah. else to change too. That's that's yeah. that's just not the case. Maybe we've lost our sense of smell for cat urine. <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> you know, because people, yeah. hoarding, people who hoard cats, they, you can't go near their apartments. It's just an awful situation. This, this paper just came out. Yeah. It's 2016. And, uh, Which journal did it get published in? Psychiatrist. But, right. And uh, yeah, the uh, Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, March. So it was sent by Anthony and then our colleague here in the department earlier today. Oh, it's also from sent, here. It's from no, no, here. Anthony, our listener, oh, sent oh, oh, it, okay. and then our colleague here also emailed it to us this morning. Remember? Okay, okay. You but sure? You, no, I thought you implied that somebody from here actually published. Yeah. It. No, 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 no. But they have the idea that this is another of these chronic low-level immune activation. And so, if you reviewed, if you reviewed this paper, I mean, what were what would be your objections to? I need to know more about it before I would well, consider publishing. The, pro- the problem is, the paper is is properly done. All right, the, the statistics are there, but it doesn't prove anything. No, it does not. So you can't reject it and say, "I need." No causative data because they can't get it what right? about ingeniuses what about people who win the nobel prize what about you know could you say maybe they're affected <laughs> well, by this I too would, <laughs> it would be nice to have an animal model but i think it's very hard to show aggression in an animal model isn't it no, no, no. well i might, think they they do actually have an animal model and i think in the animal model the data 